Plastic air care, plastic sound we've caught here for a Christmassy edition of the Connection Connection. <laughs> Howdy, howdy, howdy. Welcome to a Thursday Collection Connection, where it's all about that game. It's just an excuse to talk about records. Play the game with my brother, Plastic Eric, from the Plastic Soundway Cult channel. And uh, he does his videos every Monday. I put mine out every Thursday. So let's just get to it. In Eric's last video, he showed Bent by Stonefield. He predicted uh, that maybe it wouldn't be my style. Uh, he compared them to Iron Butterfly, but I don't know, really, I don't know any Iron Butterfly beyond Inagata De Vita. And what it made me think of was 80s Rush, like moving pictures kind of thing, spacey keyboards, prog rock conventions. But it used those prog rock conventions, so things like big ponderous chords and messing around with time signatures and things to create pop songs. That made me think of time also of Temples, I think the third track on the album. I already forget the name of it, but uh, really had kind of a temples -y beginning, which Temples themselves throw back to the uh, psychedelic kind of era of late 60s, early 70s. But all in all, it wasn't bad. It wasn't anything that I would buy, but it wasn't hard to listen to. And the songs were concise, not one of the tougher ones that he's <laughs> assigned me. And for a connection, first I want to say that uh, my connection, because the actual connection would kind of give it away, the spiritual connection to my previous album, which was uh, Release Me by The Like, which was their second album and sort of completely redefined who they were. They ended up only making the two albums, but likewise, I always have to remind myself that, that the album I'm about to show was not this artist's first album. They put out one that didn't make a whole lot of noise and just sort of fell in with its scene before really coming up with an angle that redefined sort of everything about the artist. So that is kind of a spiritual connection to my previous presentation of, of the like. But the actual connection to Stonefield is that the album Bent, uh, track two, I think, on Bent is called Dog Eat Dog. And so sometimes you go for the easy win. I saw the Dog Eat Dog and immediately I thought of the hit single from uh, 19, I think the single is maybe 1981, but uh, the album is from 1980, and that is Kings of the Wild Frontier by Adam and the Ants. It came out in, in late 1980, but I read that it was the number one selling album in, for 1981 in the UK. Adam and the Ants made really no headway in the U.S. It wasn't until he went solo. Adam and the Ants put out three albums. And once he went solo, he had a hit in the U.S. with Goody Two Shoes off the album Friend or Foe, his first solo album. But Eric and I were living in England at the time. And for Kings of the Wild Frontier, he kind of exploded on the scene. And I remember with his next album, Prince Charming, the lead single for that, which I think was Stand and Deliver, it was either the title track or Stand and Deliver, debuted at number two on the singles chart, which was quite a feat back then, and ultimately went to number one. He didn't score any number one singles off of Kings of the Wild Frontier, but he did have three hit singles from it, uh, the title track and Ant Music and Dog Eat Dog. So that's my connection an album with a song called Dog Eat Dog on it. So the first Adam and the Ants album, which was Dirk Wears White Socks, was just sort of art punk, maybe dark and doomy a little bit, and didn't stand out necessarily from the crowd. It wasn't until Kings of the Wild Frontier, and uh, with his 
band, interesting, a lot of, I think a lot of people know this, uh, the two trivia facts uh, that I think are just sort of out there about Adam Ant. One is his real name is Stuart Goddard. And two is that uh, his manager, who is not named Marcel Marceau, but that's the name that popped into my head, the very famous uh, British manager, and gosh dang it, I'm going to blank on his name. He took Adam Ant's backing band and used it to form uh, Bow Wow Wow. And so he had developed a style with uh, the Burundi style drumming, very powerful kind of drumming. And that was now going to go to Bow Wow Wow. And since it was something new, something people hadn't heard, he scrambled to come up with a new backing band, uh, including uh, his longtime uh, bandmate, uh, Marco Peroni. And they really quickly put together an album to get it out into the marketplace before Bow Wow Wow could release anything. And, and it was a sensation. So it kind of took his, his pre-existing interest in fashion and sort of kicked off the new romantic era. You know, it's very costumey. You could see from the cover. Um, some would probably call it problematic these days, um, especially the song Kings from the Wild, Kings of the Wild Frontier. Um, great, great song, but uh, maybe a little for an you know English uh, art school student maybe a little too much affinity with uh, Native Americans, where, <laughs> I don't know. I think it would probably be called cultural appropriation today. Uh, but he did uh, champion them and basically took on a series of personas that were historical and sort of cavalier, kind of a rogues gallery, pirates, and highwaymen and, um, you know, Indian warriors, all with kind of, you know, like charming bad guys, uh, kind of dangerous swagger, charm. And he really hit a home run with it. The song Ant Music is, a, uh, yeah, a little odd. Uh, overall, this was, Adam and the Ants was so much sort of about branding that there were an alarming number of songs that were just sort of about thumbing their nose at the old guard. <laughs> and that kind of obvious presentation where, where the, the persona, you know, in the dawn of the sort of the MTV era, even though MTV wasn't there yet when he first kicked off, the visuals, you know, kind of really became uh, a key part, you know, the, the whole tiger beat aesthetic that really made him stand out and got him a lot of attention and is probably the kind of thing that um, pre-existing music fans heralded as the end of music, um, as everybody seems to when the new music comes along. And yet it's weirdly silly. It's this blend of these big, you know, kind of this big drum sound with a spaghetti Western aesthetic. You know, a lot of the guitar sounds very much like an Ennio Morricone soundtrack for a spaghetti western and he's singing about you know these historical figures a lot of the time and dressing up like them and being just uh, very very whatever jolly roger is, is the pirate persona but the song there's ants invasion and ant music but some of the music still sounded like the the first album i guess um and didn't quite catch uh, the public ear as much but he was a sensation, Adam the Ant. Adam Ant was everywhere it felt like in the uh, last half of our time in England from uh, 1980, late 1980 here to 1984 when we left. Uh, he was huge. And yeah, so I know Eric knows Adam the Ant. I don't know if he knows this whole album. I didn't get it initially. Uh, he was one that I had kind of a hits collection of. I was brought to think about him again around the time he had, was it maybe in the early 90s or very, very late 80s, uh, 
comeback single called Wonderful. That didn't sound anything, it was very acoustic, didn't sound anything like Adam and the Ants. It didn't even really sound like his initial solo material, which was still kind of in that swooning romance novel cover sort of field. It was just kind of a sweet song, and that got me thinking about Adam and the Ants again. And that was a time when uh, I might, my go-to strategy would be pick up a Greatest Hits, and that would probably satisfy me. So it was a while, and he's one of those ones that I waited for uh, a remaster or looked for, you know, a remaster campaign. So this is actually a nice two, two disc. Um, reissue, he's had a couple of reissue campaigns. But uh, yeah, it's fun. It's a good listen. I don't know that it's quite as classic. I think it's it's classic status is, I don't want to say largely nostalgia driven, but kind of nostalgia driven. Uh, some of the songs really hold up. Some of them, they, they hold up while being very much of their time, I should, I should say. I think Prince Charming actually is one of the great singles of the 80s. Off, the, off of his next album, the title track off of that. Uh, I'm waiting for somebody to do a killer cover of Prince Charming. Maybe take out the the screaming, <laughs> the ah -ha, that part. Anyway, I'm rambling. I'm gonna throw Kings of the Wild Frontier from 1980. Adam and the Ants over to Eric. He will come up with a connection uh, to this album and play his play on Monday. So you can look for that there on the Plastic Soundwave Cult. And with that, I've said my piece, so I thank you for watching. Bye-bye.